Summer is coming to an end in Antarctica. The crew of the academic Fyodorov is waiting for the Maladyozhnaya research station to pack up for winter. Everything has to be done quickly. If the wind gets any stronger, the helicopter won't be able to take off, and there's no other way of getting people onto the ship from the station. They need to hurry. Winter begins tomorrow. Maladyozhnaya used to be the Soviet Union's biggest Antarctic research station. Now it only works during the summer. In the southern hemisphere, summer starts in December and ends in March. It's now April, so seasonal operations are over. Geological samples gathered during the summer are loaded into containers. All water is drained from the station and windows are boarded up and filled in with insulation foam. If the snow is given even the slightest chance to sneak in, it will be impossible to dig it out. The diesel generator is the last to be shut down. No one can survive here without heat. The operation takes just a few hours to complete. Now the station is ready for winter. The helicopter will fly people to the academic Fyodorov. Hello there, Arnold. Good to see you. Good to see you back here. They told us you'd come. You're here, and fortune is smiling upon us again. Everything's going to be great. I'm going to be 85 in April. Now I only go to the dacha. <laughs> and Antarctica. <laughs> I'm drawn towards it. My wife isn't even aware of these expeditions in the last few years. Russia's expeditions to Antarctica set off from Cape Town, South Africa. While the ship stays in port for a few days, the team members enjoy some time off. Many of them want to take a tour to the Cape of Good Hope. Unfortunately, there's not enough space on the bus, so the polar explorers decide to draw lots to determine who gets to go. In the Soviet era, to get to Antarctica, it wasn't enough to just be lucky. You needed relevant experience with drift ice in the Arctic as well as recommendations. There was no other way to reach the southernmost continent. Today, it's enough to send your resume to the Arctic and Antarctic Research Institute, along with a clean bill of health. Alexei and Artyom met just two days ago. Both are newcomers, and both are heading to Antarctica for the first time. They're going to spend the whole winter together at the Novolazarevskaya station. Look, he bit me! I heard about it in the Institute, but I just put it on the back burner at the time. It wasn't what I was dreaming about constantly. I wasn't even thinking about Antarctica six months ago. I was pretty scared about two days before we were meant to leave. I didn't feel that way. But when you actually realize it's here, when the date is set and your dream is ready to come true, it's tough. What's next? I don't know. We'll see. If I like it, I'll keep doing it. But if not, so be it. Artyom and Alexei will both fly to Antarctica from Cape Town. The landing strips can only operate for short periods each year. The weather is too unreliable and the distance too great. For example, even in early autumn, the temperature at the Vostok station falls to 60 degrees below zero. Skids can get no traction when the snow is that cold. 
In a month's time, the academic Fyodorov will deliver a year's worth of food and fuel for the Novolazarevskaya station, where Artyom and Alexei will spend the winter. The ship is a floating headquarters. On board are the head of the seasonal expedition, Vladimir Kuchin, and the head of the winter team, Viktor Venderovich. Right now I spend less time at home than in Antarctica. Of course my family is waiting for me back home, but I think they get fed up with me after a while. They are used to living without me. That's just the way it is. Viktor Vendorovich gave me one toilet roll. He told me it would be enough until I get home. I said, for a year? And he answered, when I say home, I mean Antarctica. <laughs> Those who are experienced are already used to it. The newcomers have this mix of romanticism and pragmatism. I used to be a bureaucrat. Seriously. But at some point I just started to feel that Antarctica was the only thing that was true and real. Johnny Sukhanov from St. Petersburg and Mark Glinin, a doctor from Vologda, are going to spend the whole year at the Progress Research Station. It's time to clear things up and answer the main question. Who am I? And what changes await us? They'll probably happen. This is Antarctica. Kind of uncomfortable after the ship, right? Arnold Budretsky was one of the pioneers of Russian Antarctica. There was nothing here except for ice and rock before the first generation of explorers, with plenty of experience in the North Pole, landed here on the southern continent. Arnold, hello! <laughs> It was Bedreski who built two Russian stations from the ground up. He spent almost every winter here. Our first joint expedition was number 19. This is good. Keeping up with the tradition of photographing each winter team. It's really good. Arnold has come to check up on the Progress Station after its reconstruction. It's recently been named the capital of the Russian expedition. Are you happy? I can see that compared to other stations here, this place is heaven. The most important event in the life of a station is staff rotation. Hello, everybody. 25 people will be spending this winter at the Progress Station. So, who is who? I'm Johnny. The head of the station is like a ship's captain. He is responsible for everything. Without his permission, no one can leave the station. A little later, they'll be given a mandatory briefing, although many of them don't need it. This is not their first winter here. Hello, comrade. Hello there. So who knows our places? Do you? I do. Long time no see, Vadim. Okay, doctors. So, are you guys in the know? You know your places? Take the doctors. Are you a doctor too? Take this one, it'll be your room. All stations are laid out in roughly the same way. They have cabins, a mess hall, and a galley. The first expeditions arrived here by ship. As a result, marine slang is often used. The galley has its own rotor, and everyone takes their turn at routine tasks. This is absolutely a second home. You don't have to feel that it's temporary. When you're here, you have to feel at home. A year is a long time. It's not so easy to live here for a year. So, Johnny, have you settled in? Not yet. I'm waiting on my partner. He's probably busy with science right now. Science? Get him food, you mean? I don't know. Today, the whole station is focused on the same job. 
Unloading food containers brought in by helicopter from the academic Fyodorov. Old and new teams are working together. The winter team is made up of a few scientists, a chef, two doctors and others responsible for maintaining the research station. It's easy to see at first glance who's already spent a year here. There are no women here, why should I shave? It's really difficult to spend a year with just guys. I never smoked before, but I started to after I became the head of the station, because they were always complaining. Someone eats with their mouth open, or someone doesn't wash their socks, or someone snores, or someone said something inappropriate about their wife or mother. Complaints every single day. Women did not spend winter at the Russian stations. Married couples were brought here several times as an experiment, but it didn't work out. They sent an engineer here once. His wife was a cook. It was hard work. She had to carry heavy bags and lots of meat. Of course she couldn't do it. So he had to drop what he was doing and help her. He couldn't do his job because of that, because he had to help her. And that's even touching the deeper psychological issues. There are two cooks here. The weather may change, but lunch can never be postponed. We've got Solyanka soup here. Goulash with buckwheat on the side. Steak with onions and mushrooms fried beef liver, and sausages. I always say, guys, why do you love sausages so much? Look what we've got. Steak a la Francaise, liver, all these cutlets. What is it with sausages? So now what they do is they put all the good stuff on one plate and then come back with another plate and take two more sausages. It doesn't matter. After consulting with the cook, the station head has to buy food. For example, instead of buying lemons, it's better to get limes. They stay fresh longer. Experience has taught them ways to keep goods fresh for a whole year. Eggs can be preserved for a whole year if you turn them every 10 days. That way the yolk won't dry up and go bad. Space should be left between bags to keep onions. But it's impossible to say how long a cabbage can stay fresh. One time I peeled it all the way to the center, and I wrapped each one in paper after, like they used to in old times. But it didn't help. It kept going off. I wrapped each cabbage head, but there were no changes. So I don't know. That is why it stays in its string bag now. If it starts rotting, we peel it and eat it quickly. Antarctica teaches, heals and breaks you, but it trains you as well. I'm much more modest now. This is my sixth winter here. It's been nine years in Antarctica already. They ask me all the time, why do you go there, you idiot? You saw it once, okay, twice. There's nothing special about it. People change, that's true, they do. First of all, when they go back home, they're already dreaming of returning here again. You might think there could be nothing more monumental and timeless than the view of this landscape. But it is only temporary. Over three days, the view will change at least three times. Just a few days remain for the summer team to hand over to their winter colleagues. Former bureaucrat Johnny Sukhanov spent a year studying magnetology. He really wanted to come to the Antarctic. Every station has its own magnetic room. There are no metallic objects in such rooms. The air temperature is kept stable at approximately 25 degrees Celsius. 
A computer constantly records changes, and time has to be accurate to the nanosecond. Clocks must be adjusted in a very special way. For three days we can only take notes. There's no time to make changes. Alexei Simonov dreamed about Antarctica for several years. For example, if we take a compass in Russia, it will show us north that way. But if you take it here, it will show north that way, even though it's that way. If we follow the compass as we used to do it in Russia, we won't end up in India as expected, but in Chile, South America. As a student, he proposed his own geological theory. It was important to him to go to Antarctica to collect the data he needed. I didn't find anything new for it, though. But here there are no influences, like TV or anything like that. You have to sit and think. Simply sitting and thinking. The station's ionosphereist keeps his instruments in a corner of the same room. His job is to monitor high altitude conditions. All the data he collects has to be sent to an institute in St. Petersburg, and the equipment needs regular adjustment. In fact, every polar job has its own specifics. Such details are handed down to each new generation of polar explorer. These balloons can rise to 42 kilometers. They all carry sensors that relay information to a console at the station. Our work is very important. We make aeronautical charts for aircraft, like how high helicopters can fly, for instance. Similar balloons are released simultaneously all over the world, at midnight GMT. Russian polar explorers have long invented new ways to make the process more efficient, such as how to make them easier to release. It is so short, but we can still send up the balloon like this. There's about 50 meters of rope here. How to make it go higher? We soak the balloon in a mixture of kerosene and benzene. We came up with it. It makes it fly higher. It can fly up to 30 kilometers. Without it, it will only go as high as 22. Other countries don't care so much about how high their balloons go. And how to make it faster. They're inflated with hydrogen. There's a rope down there. It's our reference point. I can check the top point of the balloon by using that. There we go. Today, none of the scientists remember who actually came up with these ideas. It comes from Arctic experience. It was our own atmospheric scientists who invented them. Not every Antarctic station has its own atmospheric scientist, but all of them have a meteorologist. He doesn't get the chance to get eight hours of sleep because he has to submit weather data every six hours, and he has to go to the weather station every day. The Antarctica has a sort of utilitarian value. Let's take the weather data as an example. If we have all the data, the prediction and models will work out. If you cover Antarctica with your palm, and there will be no information from there anymore, all the models that we are used to will fail. Generally, almost all of the scientific work in Antarctica in winter comes down to monitoring investigations and observing different processes. To be honest, science doesn't play the main role here. Even though all of us pretend to do it here, the main idea of our Antarctic activity is geopolitics. It's the most important thing here. Science is just more for show. Our goals are more global. We have to make sure we have a claim here. Water for the station is drawn from glacial lakes. At the Progress station, they can automatically get water from a nearby lake. But the polar explorers don't like it. They're used to going to the remote lakes. Water there seems to taste better, but it's an illusion. All water here is the same after distillation. And because of the lack of minerals, polar explorers constantly suffer from dental problems. 
Алексей, I'm scared. The last one on the right. Do you want me to pull it out? It's better to fill it. Multivitamins sit on the table and the guys forget to take them. It's difficult to treat them and diagnose it in time. They hold out until the last moment when they can't stand it anymore. I was afraid because they pull my teeth out all the time here. I've lost four in this room alone. It's my sacrifice to Antarctica. It's been a month since Artyom and Alexei started at Novolazarevskaya station. Artyom is an anesthesiologist, but thankfully this month there have been no medical emergencies. I even started to study English and set up a computer here. Alexei helped me. He installed a ton of different programs. Everything I've planned, I've done. Usually I don't have time for anything or to think about anything seriously. But here we have an opportunity to stop and think. It's the first step. That was the most important thing to me. After a month, the newcomers have settled into station life, which works to a strict schedule. There's one meteorologist, one aerologist, one seismologist, one geophysicist. We still have plenty of work to do. No one will do it for you. All the kinks are worked out. I was really impressed by that. The doors swing inward. All of them do. It means the wind won't wrench it out of your hand and fling it open. All the houses are placed in a row, with a little tilt from east to west. The wind here blows from east to west, that's why. All of the roads and main trails have rails and ropes, so you can hold on to them if it's windy. Once I called our rooms suites, and they burst out laughing. They said they were called cabins. Well, okay then, a cabin is a cabin. After a month, Alexei has a little more experience and can do his own research. His main task is to investigate the Earth's climate. He has to make a range of observations of the sky researching lunar reflections, polar aurorae, and solar phenomena. Today is the last day to check all the technical details with the help of his predecessor. You have to change the filters here because of the bright moon. So be easy, take your time. Things have to be arranged in a proper way. Tomorrow he'll leave with the rest of the old crew and the new will begin their winter tour of duty. We have a new group of specialists here now. All of them are young. How are they going to get along with each other? I don't know. How old are you? 20? Yeah. I'm the youngest engineer here. I'm 23. I'm the youngest one here! <laughs> yeah, by two months. <laughs> These last few days before winter are always the busiest. It's when the men have to stock up a year's worth of inventory. They work all day long. A ship only lands here once a year, so there's a great deal to do, and plenty of containers to unload. All of them are waiting for the last helicopter. In my heart, I already feel good here. So the only thing is to get along with the new guys and that will be that. It'll take a month to get acquainted with the guys and get used to them. Only after that I'll consider it the beginning of winter. After 50 years of a Russian presence in Antarctica, the definition of a polar explorer has changed. The things I've seen in the movies and the things we have here now are completely different. We sit here now talking about today's watermelon, which was not so tasty, and then we retire to our European-style rooms. That's an obvious difference. The lives of those who built it all up from the very beginning and conquered nature here were completely different. Okay, Alexander, good luck to you! Traditionally, the last helicopter to leave will circle the station. 
The ship leaving Antarctica will sound its horn three times, signalling the start of winter. I still remember that feeling. The helicopter made its last farewell circle and was off. It was the beginning of winter and only 32 people were left. I felt kind of sad. Then the long polar nights begin, along with inevitable depression because of six months' absence of sun, exhausting snowstorms, long letters home, and the desire to see friends and family. But even after all that, many will still dream about coming back. Fortunately, there's plenty of work here in Antarctica for many generations to come. <laughs> an unsolved mystery for me? <laughs> that is an interesting question. Why does this place attract me so, so much? Blowing already? Three goodbye horns. The Antarctic winter has begun.